Hi everybody, my name is John Doan. I'm the city administrator for the city of Tumwater. And that makes me essentially the chief operating officer for um, the organization that has about a 200 and some million dollar budget. And I work directly with our CEO, who is uh, the city's mayor, Debbie Sullivan. And I'm gonna walk everyone through um, sort of some quick summary of how the city pays for services. And city services, local services, um, are pretty exciting to me because they're really the first ones we see every day and they're the services um, in our community that we experience the most directly. You know, we, we get out of bed and we turn the water on or we flush or we get a drink of water. And then as our day progresses, we drive to work on city streets. Um, we may continue to use city utilities. In the evening, we may uh, go for a walk in a park. We may take our um, kids to a to a baseball game. Um, we may go to a local concert and all the time we have police and fire and emergency medical services available to help us out um, if we need those um, somewhere in the community. And so they're the, they're the first things that we see. And we just, I'd love to talk about sort of how we pay for the, those things um, within our community. Um, sort of a short summary, the city has a two-year budget, we, are, um, we, we budget on what's called a biennium, um, and it's around a $200 million budget, uh, depending on um, how you count some of the reserves and the capital budgets and things like that. Um, organized into about 27 funds, some people call them buckets. Uh, most of those buckets exist either for accounting reasons or legal reasons to keep money separated um, and, and to be able to better account for it. Uh, we are audited every year by the state auditor, uh, both for state and federal compliance. The federal compliance depends on how much federal grant money we take in in a particular year. Uh, but those um, audits both look at uh, financial compliance, but also compliance with things like uh, public records laws, open public meetings, things like that. Um, one of the underlying rules um, of city budgeting is one-time revenues being used for one-time expenses um, and we obviously have fluctuations there will be years when there's a lot of construction so we have a lot of construction sales tax we want to make sure that we don't commit those dollars to things that are long-term expenses like employees those become great opportunities to put money into savings put money into reserves uh, pay for equipment those kinds of things um, and then focus on ongoing revenue, things like property tax, that are used to pay for uh, staff. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about one of our challenges, which is a structural deficit uh, in local government. And that is that um, because of voter approved initiatives, our property tax um, can only go up by about 1% per year. But yet the cost of running the city goes up by on average about three and a half percent per year. And so that structural deficit creates a gap and that gap has to be filled with um, looking for efficiencies, other types of revenue, growth in sales tax, growth in utility taxes, or other types of revenues that can come into the city um, in order to keep that gap. And that structural deficit exists for all of, all of local government um, throughout the state of Washington. Um, there are two basic revenue sources. Um, first is taxes, and taxes are things that are paid for by everyone for the public good. And um, the city council, for the most part, has discretion on how those are spent. Um, and so those are things like a utility tax, property tax, sales tax. Um, and different cities may make different decisions on how to spend those, those monies. The other general revenue source um, that comes in is a fee or a charge. And so that usually involves someone's discretion or choice as to whether or not they want to purchase that service. Things like applying for a permit, um, a permit fee, or a recreation fee, or even um, utility taxes, which vary depending on how much of a water or sewer service that you use. And those are, those are very specific and um, related to, to on-demand services. When you look at, and we'll focus 
primarily on the city's general fund, one of those 27 buckets that I mentioned. And that's really where the bulk of city services come from when people think about local government, police, fire, parks, courts. Um, when we look at the revenue picture, um, this is pretty typical in the state of Washington. The two primary revenue sources are sales tax and property tax. And then you have some other revenue sources um, that come in. So, so sales and property are about 50% of our equation. Uh, we have a hefty amount of money, around 10% comes in from what's called intergovernmental revenue. Most of that intergovernmental revenue is from the county's Medic One program that supports our provision of advanced life support or paramedics uh, within our community and a smaller amount of money to support basic life support um, through the fire department. There's also some utility tax. We are one of... Um, we're also one of the cities that applies a business and occupation tax or a B&O tax. Not all cities in Washington do that. And you can see when you bring all those together, you're probably 75% of the city's revenue. And then there's a mixture of permit fees and interfund charges between departments, for example, where the accounting department or the finance department provides a service to a utility, then the utility pays for that service um, to be provided. So that's how the money comes in to the city's general fund. The expenses um, are also fairly typical. Um, it's very common that public safety is about 50% of a city's general fund budget. And so for us, it's about 51, 52% are police, fire, and court. Um, that also includes prosecution, public defense, and then the actual administration of the court. Other, other programs uh, within the general fund are parks and recreation, streets, finance, um, and um, community development and permitting. The city's non-departmental um, part of the general fund really provides services across the organization and it's, for, it's to account for programs that don't fit neatly into a single department, such as um, the, city, the city's overall insurance um, payment or uh, animal services or dues to things like the Thurston Regional Planning Council. When we um, slice up the city's sales tax, and Washington is a state that has a fairly high sales tax, um, we see here sort of an example of how that money is um, actually divided. So these are the number of cents that would be paid on a $1 taxable transaction in Washington state. And you see six and a half cents of that goes to the state of Washington. So they're the, they're the primary beneficiary of that sales tax. And then there are, so there's about 1.7 cents, which is a mixture of local option sales taxes that may be imposed um, by local organizations or voted on by the public. Um, these include things like cities, counties, uh, transit organizations um, that could add up to as much as 1.7 cents. Uh, there's also um, 0.15 cents that's available to the county uh, that they use to actually manage the collection of the sales tax and 0.85 cents that actually can come to the city. There's another 0.2 cents that comes um, to a transportation benefit district, which is managed by, this, by the city. So um, all told, um, it's about um, 1.05 cents of sales tax on a, on a $1 purchase uh, that comes to the city. When we look at where your property tax goes, uh, that's this next chart, the, the largest recipient of property tax in Washington state is the state school system. Um, and this, this particular chart is based on Thurston County. Um, if you were a, and you were a taxpayer in Tumwater, 39% uh, would go to the schools, 23% goes to the state. The city gets about 19% of that money. The county then gets 9%. You have a metropolitan park district, which gets 4%, which is also managed by the city of Tumwater. So it all, all told, the city gets 4% uh, plus the 19%. And then you can see there's a lot of other smaller slices, including the library, Medic One, the port, um, and, and some very small 
um, slices that add up to even less than 1% um, of your property tax bill. How much do you actually pay in taxes to the city of Tumwater? Um, and this is, to me, this is always fascinating because, you know, we pay taxes to the federal government, we pay taxes to the state, and then we pay taxes locally. And as I said earlier, we often have a very strong connection to the services that are provided locally. Um, and we have less of a connection to those that are provided that, you know, the larger the organization, such as the, the national government. Um, if you take an average home of about three hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, which is sort of, you know, the lower the lower middle of the price range at this point in our community, um, you know, they're going to pay someone's going to pay around eight hundred dollars um, in property tax um, to the city. You're also going to pay into the Metropolitan Park District to the tune of about one hundred and fifty dollars, depending on what you purchase in a particular year. Um, but if you assume about $6,000 worth of taxable purchases, you're going to pay about $50 in sales tax. You similarly would pay about $12 into the Transportation Benefit District. You'll pay about $300 in utility tax. And potentially, if you operate a business, uh, you would pay B&O tax based on that business. Um, but when you put all those together, it actually adds up to about $1,300. Um, which, which is a pretty good deal, I think, for all of the services that you provide, that, that we provide to you. Um, we have some other funds, I'll go through them really quick. Um, in addition to the general fund, uh, we have a lodging tax, which collects money from hotel and motel stays in our community. Um, it's a 4% it's a charge, um, and it's, it has a lot of state limitations on how that money can be spent. Um, some of it can be only spent on promoting ho more hotel stays and tourism. Um, others can be used for cultural programs and historic programs, and that's one of the places and one of the ways that the city funds historic preservation programs. We have a debt service fund that pays for uh, general fund programs where we um, have, have borrowed money to build something like a um, pay for fire engines or energy retrofits um, within our facilities. We have a number of capital facility plan funds, which are um, funding and planning for major capital projects, whether they are water tanks or fire trucks or parks um, or street projects. We have an e-link and fiber fund, which is we're actually leasing out um, fiber um, and conduit underneath our streets and um, people can um, lease from us um, a certain amount of that capacity and then we reuse that revenue in order to create our fiber system that connects city facilities. We have utilities, water, sewer, and storm. They each have their own independent um, funds that operate like a business. They have to be, they have to be self-sustaining they don't have as broad of a revenue stream as the general fund does. So it's one of the reasons why they're rate dependent. And when we talk about the cost of the city going up by three and a half percent per year, the same thing applies to the utilities. And it's the reason why utility rates are usually in that range of three, three and a half percent per year, because it's really the only revenue source they have. We have some internal service funds. We also knew in 2020, we. Um, implemented an affordable housing fund, which is collecting um, dedicated state sales tax. It didn't raise the sales tax, but it's collecting a piece of the sales tax that the state of Washington um, gets and is dedicating it to affordable housing. We have a Barnes Lake Management District, which um, supports the maintenance and the um, operation, so to speak of Barnes Lake and the people who live around Barnes Lake pay for, pay for that to happen. So what does the future hold? When we think about sort of the future for the city and how do we pay for things, um, we like to think in terms of um, what we call um, revenue drivers and expense drivers. And so we begin with um, the revenues um, and it's important to keep in, in mind that in the state of Washington, growth becomes incredibly important just because of our tax structure. Um, growth creates property tax increase, 
uh, it creates sales tax from construction, it creates real estate excise tax. Um, and that, that cities that don't have that kind of growth um, often struggle to pay their bills. Um, we have a 1% property tax cap, and we talked about that earlier and how that creates a structural deficit. We also have a limitation on our property tax of $3.10, um, and that's leaving, we're leaving some room for the library um, in that calculation. Um, so often in Washington, retail and retail growth is incredibly important. Um, again, it doesn't, it doesn't have a cap. Um, and it's just, a, it's just an important part of being able to sort of balance that equation given that property taxes is limited to the 1% growth. We also, we have to think about sort of how uh, retailing is changing. Um, even prior to the pandemic, we were seeing a shift away from traditional box retailing, retail stores, and more and more online. And um, that helps some communities and hurts others. Uh, communities that had um, a lot of shopping malls are struggling as people move more away from some of those shopping malls. Um, but then we also have a thing called destination sales tax, which means you now in Washington pay the sales tax for the most part based on where an item is delivered or, um, or shipped to, as opposed to where it was shipped from. And that's been a change over the past 15 years. We also uh, have to think about the sharing of revenues between the state of Washington and Washington State, or Washington State's jurisdictions like cities. Um, and that applies to things like liquor revenue, marijuana taxes, uh, traffic tickets, things like that, where there's been a split and some of the revenue goes to the state and some goes to cities. And we oftentimes see over time that moving towards the state um, taking more of that money and you know the original split was created based on a premise that if there are impacts from those activities they're occurring at both the state and the local level so we we continue to try to advocate for um, that that split to maintain and, and provide funding at the local level um, we often hear and I often hear well why don't we just get a grant for something and there are just fewer and fewer of those state and federal grant programs and fewer of just wide open grants. So often they will be grants with significant match components um, or they have a lot of strings attached to them, sometimes making them more expensive to actually get the grant um, than to just do the work and, and pay for it ourselves. Um, and there's just more and more emphasis on sort of a local taxing authority and creating structures like Metropolitan Park District, Transportation Benefit Districts, and um, levy lid lifts that are targeted to particular city services. There are some opportunities in Tumwater when we think about um, what are opportunities for growth and, and you know, where can we target in terms of revenue. Certainly the, the brewery site is one of those. And although we have struggled with redevelopment of the actual site, uh, we have been very successful in Tumwater with work sort of, I call it, around the edges. Um, and, a, and a concept around Tumwater craft or promoting um, a, a center of excellence for brew, craft brewing, craft distilling, and craft cider making. And our partners at South Puget Sound Community College um, have been a great help in making that happen. And that continues to be an opportunity for, for growth within our community that helps Tumwater, helps the region, helps agriculture, and actually helps the entire state of Washington because almost all of the ingredients for brewing, distilling, and cider making are grown and are plentiful in the state of Washington. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities around what I call the ultimate green, which is redevelopment, as opposed to going out and finding a treed side or a green piece of property, let's focus um, our efforts in terms of you know, housing, commercial, job creation on those areas that are already developed and need to be redeveloped. And we have you know, a number of those in the brewery neighborhood. We have them on Capitol Boulevard. There's a lot of places. From a development standpoint, they're a little bit more challenging oftentimes and sometimes require a little bit of help from the city to help make those projects happen. 
We also can better utilize existing infrastructure through something we call infill. Where are there places where we have road capacity, water, sewer capacity, and we don't have to build new utility lines in order to service houses, apartment complex, commercial, job creation, industrial, those kinds of things. The Motman Industrial Park is a great example where we have infrastructure, we have available land, so how can we fill in some of those vacant parcels um, in order to create opportunities a little bit more efficiently? And then we have some new areas. Um, we've seen a lot of activity over the past two years on 93rd. Um, some of that has been um, work done by private developers. Other has, others have been um, in partnership, partnership with the Chehalis tribe who uh, just built a new truck stop uh, down there. If we, have, if we have revenue drivers, we also have expense drivers, things we have to always think about in terms of things that drive the expense slide of the city budget. And um, you know, just thinking about infrastructure deficiencies, we have um, hundreds of miles of pipe and I think over 100 miles of roadway. Um, we have to always make sure that we're setting aside money and making maintenance commitments so that we don't have that system, system fall apart. It's one of the big benefits to the Transportation Benefit District that was created a couple of years ago, and it's really been focused on the maintenance and preservation of our, of our road system. It's not about creating new capacity, but it's about maintaining the asphalt, maintaining the sidewalks, maintaining the driving surface so that it is um, appropriate for people who are driving, it's safe, and it maintains the roads um, and improves the quality of the driving experience in Tom Water. We also have to always invest in technology. Um, we have to figure out how to be more efficient. We have to figure out how to work smarter. That's not free. Uh, oftentimes we hear that we can make improvements with technology, more computers, different software, whatever, but a will of that costs money, both to buy the equipment, buy the software, maintain the software, and have the staff expertise to be able to utilize it. Um, so again, I, they're not free. Um, but they do oftentimes make our services better and more accessible to people. Employee costs, uh, salaries, keeping competitive salaries to have high quality employees, but also benefit packages that um, provide for health care, pensions, um, other type, you know, leave, things like that that employees are looking for. It's a very competitive hiring market and retention market. And we have to make sure that what we provide to our employees are the, the benefits and the compensation that draws really great people here and, and keeps them here. We always worry about inflation. Uh, it's not been an issue for you know over a dozen years, but we're seeing now significant increases in inflation. And again, keep in mind that 1% property tax cap um, the, the, the higher the inflation is away from that 1%, the more the city is just falling behind. And so that, that can be particularly worrisome. Development and redevelopment, there's just a growing expectation of the city's involvement in, a, in addressing infrastructure needs in conjunction with development. And so that has a particular cost to it. And we have to think about those and certainly prioritize to make sure that our investment leverages projects that people really want in the community. Mentioned it a little bit, but just a shortage of workers. Pre-pandemic, there was a shortage of workers um, in many of our fields, and the pandemic has certainly compounded that and, and made it much worse. Um, there's a greater emphasis on regionalization. Thurston County has a lot of regional organizations um, that work on addressing housing issues. They work on uh, animal services. We work on um, sewer treatment and water quality regionally. Um, we work on um, 911 communications dispatching. All of those are regional services and we continue to look for opportunities and efficiencies that can come with that. And lastly, on those expenditure drivers are just community priorities. What's important in a particular community in Tumwater? What do people, um, when we do surveys, when they talk to council members, what do people hear uh, that the community wants? And different communities uh, have every right in the world to set and do set 
different priorities. And so that becomes a part of that budget process um, that the city council works through every two years to try to figure out how to factor um, those, those in, how we allocate limited resources. And I'll, I'll wrap, wrap, wrap up with my little pig piggy bank here that is divided into four sections, uh, savings. So we have things like reserve funds to look for, to save for emergencies. And in the early days of COVID actually uh, dipped into some of that savings uh, in order to address um, the early parts of the COVID emergency. We have services, police officers, firefighters, uh, permits, uh, park recreation programs. Those are all services we provide. Or it's infrastructure like water and sewer pipes and roads and parks all fit under infrastructure. And lastly is investments, things that we're uh, putting money either aside or into a project um, to leverage a, an even greater outcome into the future. Things like uh, investments in economic development, investments in promoting the city, investments in craft brewing, distilling, and cider making. Uh, those all become places where we're looking for a greater return at some point in the future. And really, everything we do fits into those four um, slices of my, of my little piggy bank there. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for your interest in Tumwater and how we pay for things. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free. There's contact information at the end of this video. Feel free to contact me or um, other folks in the city. And we'd love to talk more about it, talk to your organization, and make sure that we answer your questions.